So one of the questions that people have about pawpaws is, are they self-fertile? Now this is a more complex question than it might appear. The flowers, when they bloom, they open as female and slowly become male. So if you have two flowers on one tree opening at different times, hypothetically, they could pollinate themselves. Um, however, self-fertility has only been observed in a few select individuals, and in general, the species is not self-fertile. So you'll see some resources saying the pawpaws are not self-fertile. This is not exactly accurate. It is self-fertile to a small degree, uh, and it varies depending. Now, one of the most common myths about pawpaws is that they require shade for the first few years of their life. Now, this myth likely comes from the fact that young seedlings are photosensitive and they are naturally an understory tree in the forest. Um, however, it is only the first year just emerging seedlings that are sensitive to sunlight. First year seedlings need protection from sun. After they've hardened their wood during the first season and come into their second season, then they can handle full sunlight. The main thing with pawpaws is that they have consistent access to water. Um, and that is what permits them to grow in full sunlight from age two and onwards. Now, one of the more pervasive myths about pawpaws and ananaceous fruits in general has to do with a class of compounds known as ananaceous acetogenins, spelled out for you. Acetogenin is a waxy substance that is produced by the tree. Um, it's present in the bark, leaves, twigs, fruit flesh, and particularly concentrated in the seeds of the fruit. Now these compounds are of interest to science in recent years because they are strongly cytotoxic to cancer cells. They inhibit a mitochondrial pathway in the cell, causing it to die. Um, the issue is that they also do this to healthy cells, neurocells in particular. So there is a neurotoxic effect if you consume too much of this particular compound. So the question becomes, how much are we eating when we consume a pawpaw fruit or a cherimoya or a soursop? Now, because it's a waxy substance, acetogenin is poorly soluble, and that makes it poorly bioavailable to human digestion. Now, one of the consistent things they're addressing in cancer studies is the poor bioavailability. In order to utilize the cytotoxic effects, they have to make the compounds more bioavailable than they are inherently. Um, I'll show some links down below so you can look at these studies for yourself. Now, acetogenin is not exclusive to pawpaws or to Anonaceae family generally. They are also found in Lauraceae, the avocado family, um, which includes avocados, bay leaves, a few other fruits that are commonly eaten. And for this reason, I have no concern when I'm eating these fruit. You do so only for a few months out of the year. So you're eating a small amount over a short period of time, and this does not cause any concern for me. Um, other people may feel differently. However, I do not worry about it. So in parts of the pawpaw's native range that overlap with past human habitation areas, we find fruits coming out of the woods that are bigger, better, and more luscious than your average fruits. And this speaks to a past of human domestication. Now, to what extent humans carried it throughout its range and deliberately selected it is unclear. We, we've lost all that to history. But it is safe to say that there is some degree of human influence on the pawpaw as a species. Now, when you compare Asimina triloba to its brother and sister species in Florida, like Asimina parviflora or Asimina uh, reticulata, you see that those fruits are very small and seedy and starchy and very much still wild fruits. If this species was anything like that at some point, it certainly isn't anymore. So this also lends credence to the concept of human influence over time. Now I consider pawpaws at least semi-domesticated, uh, passively so. Um, to what degree is uncertain, but I, do, I no longer consider them a wild fruit.